Hello everyone. So, what I thought I would do here is this is going to be the first of a series of videos I want to do like this where we're just going to break down and really examine um, some of the pieces by some of my favorite composers uh, as well as contemporary artists like rock bands. And we're going to pick apart each aspect uh, of the piece so that you can really further understand the inner workings like on a really deep level. Because I find if you really want to, you know, take your influences and be able to really incorporate them into your own work, you really need to understand the deep inner workings of like, for example, what is a composer's preference with harmony? What is their preference with rhythm? What is their preference with orchestration? And on that note, the first thing we're going to be taking a look at is actually Igor Stravinsky's 1910 legendary ballet, The Firebird. And we'll be taking a look at The Firebird Suite. This will be the first part of a three-part series. This will be entitled The Russian Era. So we'll be looking at The Firebird because it's very much representative in my mind, along with, of course, The Rite of Spring and Petrushka and The Nightingale of Stravinsky's Russian Era. After that, we'll do a part two looking at Stravinsky's neoclassical era. And then for the third part, we'll take a look at Stravinsky's late serial period. Towards the end of his life, he ended up adopting some 12-tone characteristics that were very interesting. And uh, if you guys really like what you're about to see, please consider subscribing to my Patreon. It's the kind of thing that could really enable me to do more of this stuff. Or a one-time donation on my Ko-fi account would be highly appreciated. With that being said, let's get going. Okay, guys, so the first thing I want to take a look at is we're going to start with the intro. That legendary bass line, and uh, I'll just play it for you real quick. So the first thing I want to take a look at is, again, right off the bat, we get a taste of Stravinsky's harmony. Now, if you're familiar with uh, Russian music, what I'm about to demonstrate is actually not that out of left field. But it seemed that way, obviously, to the West because it had just not been heard often. So what Stravinsky ends up implying in the very first opening of the Firebird with that bass line, the da -da 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 -da, is actually two major triads, a tritone apart. So that tritone relation. Now, that is a very Russian thing to do. In fact, this exact relation can be heard in the key moments of the opening coronation scenes of Mussorgsky's Boris Godunov opera, which, well, let me just show you right now quickly sort of how this stacks up harmonically. So if I, if I derive chords from this bass line, right? And if we look at the key of the Firebird Suite opening, we're in C flat, which is, is a bit frustrating. Stravinsky does this not to just be a stickler. There is a reason and a harmonically that he sets it up in C flat instead of B major because of some of the modulations that happen. Regardless, I'm going to not use the correct and harmonic names just because I want to demonstrate this point. So we have basically the bass line implies, and I've heard people call this an octatonic bass line. I, I tend to disagree a bit because not all notes in this opening bass line fit into one octatonic scale, either built on the E or built on the G. They don't all fit, but what they do imply is that tritone major triad relation. And so I just want to unpack that that is a very Russian thing to do. And again, the Firebird is an interesting piece because it sits somewhere in between um, sort of modern music as we think of it and the music of the Kuchka or the Mighty Five, which Mussorgsky was a part of. And so what I want to say is these chords, we're going to call them E major and B flat major. Major triad relations happens in the opening scene of Boris Godunov, which I'll insert here. <laughs> So again, this opening bass line from the Firebird gives this unsteady kind of evil feel, almost you could call it heavy metal type feel. And again, guys, if we're trying to be influenced by Stravinsky right off the bat, the first thing you would see here is this unconventional by classical or let's say Germanic standards of music, this tritonic relationship between major chords. That's a great thing to take from the Firebird if you want to get that sound. That's sort of a, like, I'll do it one more time. And... And the Mussorgsky appears as So again, very much in the Russian tradition, Firebird is that connecting tissue from the Kuchka to the future. So very cool. So another thing, so we're going to get to form in a bit, but I just want to stick with the harmony for a little bit longer. Let's call this opening bass line, we'll call this the A theme. This Let's call that theme A, right? And then when we get to here on bar seven, we have this don't the diddle the diddle ba ba diddle the diddle 
right? Let's call this theme B because these two themes will trade back and forth. And a couple things that are interesting here is one, of course, the rhythm is very Stravinsky. We have this jaunty, da -doo, da -doo, almost like a twisted kind of march. Again, we have the A theme return right here. De -da 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 now, when we get to the end of page 11 here, we go do da -da -do, da -da -do, and everybody comes back. What happens here in the woodwinds is we have a bit of chromatic mediant movement. So, so far, guys, if we're talking about Stravinsky's harmony in the Firebird, we've had tritonic relationships between major chords. And now here we have chromatic mediants. And as we go through the piece and examine the harmony of each number from the suite, guys, we're going to see that chromatic mediants, tritones, and later minor seconds are really so vital to Stravinsky's harmonic language. We're going to talk about form again and orchestration in a minute. But the harmonic language of the Firebird is really rooted in these things and also the romantic tradition of Rimsky, Korsakov, and Borodin. And again, that, that's that connection to the Kuchka that I mentioned earlier. Comes back in some pieces, for example, the Korovad and the Lullaby at the end. But we'll get it, I'm getting ahead of ourselves. Let's stick with where we're at. So... Here in this we're moving up in chromatic mediant harmonies. It sounds something like this. Again, we have the woodwinds in this B theme being put through a series of transformations with the chromatic mediants. As far as the harmonic language of the opening number, that's the most important things that I would point out. We're going to get to form and orchestration in a sec. But again, here we have in the flutes, the theme after this B theme right here, this jaunty B theme, we have the A theme return. And it's restated here in the strings before we move to the last bit before we transition into the next part of the Firebird. So that is the harmonic language or some of the key aspects of the harmonic language. Because again, as long as this D, da, 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 even if it's moved to different keys or it's if it is modulated, uh, you know, by chromatic medians, uh, you know, for example, uh, you know, it would be, it would be. Sorry, excuse me. Right? Or. So again, it's still that tritone relationship. There is still that you will always have. Uh, or, you know, if it's, if it's this, right, th that tritone relationship is key about this opening movement. And so it gives that bass line that power. So let's move on to form here. So as I stated, again, what I like to do with composers like Stravinsky or Wagner or any composer that's more dense and is more modern and is not so much tied to sonata form, Debussy, Ravel, uh, anybody like that is I try to take their pieces and force them in as best I can to the quote-unquote classical forms that we all learn sonata form ternary binary rounded, rounded binary even if the pieces are not really in those forms by using that structure I find that I'm able to better understand the form that does exist because mo almost all great composers that I know have a symmetry to their work. Even if it's not the symmetry of, say, a sonata form, there's an internal logic to a lot of these pieces. So I'm going to use terms like ternary. I'm going to use terms like rondo when I analyze the Firebird Suite going forward. But keep in mind, guys, this is me loosely appropriating these terms to understand Stravinsky's own internal logic. I, I, I'm not necessarily saying that he was like, this is going to be a ternary piece or whatnot. But Again, if we force these abstract, more abstract composers like Stravinsky, like Hindemith, like Wagner, these people into these more like forms that Mozart would use, we can start to see that internal logic play out. So here we go. As I mentioned earlier, this opening bass line, this uh, dee -da 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 -da, I'm going to call that A, right? And I mentioned that a little bit earlier when we were talking about the harmonic language of, of the chromatic mediums and the tritones. I'm going to call that A, and I'm going to call this jaunty theme B, right? So if we look at this i would call this again roughly guys roughly not anything strict i would call this a bit of a ternary piece right because we have this it's not really it's not a form right because there's no exposition there's not really a ton of development so to say in the introduction there's not a whole section but we have the opening theme is stated and then we have 
right? And then that kind of goes on. And then don't, don't, don't. I'm down here. I'm looking at the uh, the basses, guys. Don't, 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 don't. And then back up to the woodwinds here. I'm on bar 11. Right? So A and B are kind of trading. Then we have this extended B. Right? And then I would call, again, these arpeggios, which we're going to get into the orchestration of that in just a second, sort of a little bit of transitory, transitional material. And then in the flutes again, we have... Right? In the flutes, we have A returning, a bit more transitory material, restated from flutes to strings again. And then we're on to the garden of the catcher here. And then, again, we're, we're looking at the Firebird Suite, guys. I just want to emphasize that again. The condensed version, not the full ballet. If I continue going on, this will go on infinitely into a lot of stuff that isn't in the suite. But for our purposes, right at this page here on page 13, we're basically done with the introduction, right? So that's so we've gone over harmony. We've gone over form. We're going to call this a loose, loose, loose ternary form, ABA. Now let's take a look at orchestration. So one thing that's really important about this opening number is um, the use of mutes and harmonics. So we have consordino here on the viola with mute. It gives this wonderful color that's just, it, it, it just adds a light little dusting on top of the heaviness of the contrabass and the celli doubled together in this heavy. And then we kind of get We get this just this wonderful thing. I'll make a comment that horns and bassoons are a great um, are a great combo in certain ranges, in my opinion. Not in all, but I think in certain ranges because they can kind of get close to each other in range and they have different tones. So when you blend them, it's nice. I would just say I love Stravinsky's use of those tonalities, sort of in imitation here. And then we enter right here, with the horns entering a few beats later. And then we have this combination of bassoon and brass restating this B theme quite a bit. And now I want to get to this section, guys, right here on page 12, where I'm, my mouse is uh, circling, where we have the most one of the most amazing sounding things in the Firebird that is so far ahead of its time, it's almost crazy. So what Stravinsky does here in this section where we have these arpeggios in the strings is these are all consordino with mute and with harmonics. I just gotta say, it's still the most amazing sounding thing that acoustic instruments can even make this sound. When this moment happens, and I think if you guys are Stravinsky heads like I, it sounds like a sine wave synthesizer, no joke, not exaggerating. It's a beautiful tone color um, to choose in orchestration. and. Wagner did this something similar to this in the opening of Lohengrin. There's a lot of uh, strings divisi with har some playing harmonics, some not. But this with the with the mute and the, and the arpeggio just creates this wonderful um, sine wave sound. I, it's the only way I can describe it. It's again, this is 1910. It just sounded like a 70s sine wave. It, it's pretty incredible, and that's a great choice when you're orchestrating. Guys, again, we're, we're, we're analyzing this piece. We're picking it apart, all these aspects, form, harmony, and orchestration, to just know that when you're composing, there's so many interesting things to do. Um, doesn't mean that it will always sound good, because some of these things are kind of demanding, I'm not going to lie, um, to ask players to do. Stravinsky here shows us beautifully that extending the range of an instrument can just enhance a piece greatly. So that's the harmony, the... Um, orchestration and the form of the opening piece we're going to move on now to the variations the fire the dance of the firebird variations this is super interesting i want to start with the harmony of the firebird dance variations something very deceptive about this right so we have this clucking rhythm here in the strings like blink, blink this um, i'll play it for you right very interesting and we have these, these little arpeggios in the woodwinds above and in the um, clarinet, pick, uh, excuse me, piccolo clarinet, that, this fast chromatic thrill, right? If you've heard the, this part of the Firebird, you know that it's not chaotic, but let's say a little crazily whimsical. And, and that's the thing in Russian music that at that time, Stravinsky was very much in the tradition of Rimsky-Korsakov because sort of the mythological characters would get these chromatic, very off-kilter pieces and the humans would get the more romantic pieces. But that aside, what I want to point out that's super deceptive and so Stravinsky and amazing is that actually 
This whole opening number is really just based around a C sharp seven chord in the key of F sharp major. So five, seven, right? And you would never know it when you hear it. You're like, oh God, this just sounds so crazy. But check this out. Watch how easy it is in all this chaos if Stravinsky wanted to return to the one chord. Watch this, just watch this. So, <laughs> isn't that, that to me is the craziest thing because the whole time this chaos is happening, at any moment, Stravinsky could choose to go home to one. He doesn't, which I think is brilliant, obviously, it's Stravinsky. But I'm just saying a lot of stuff with Stravinsky in this period is deceptively more, not simple, but it's almost like he takes sort of bass harmonic ideas and expands them out so much with rhythmic density and with chromaticism and stuff that you're closer to normal than you would think, right? So that is um, an interesting thing to note about this. And again, I want to mention further throughout this piece, again, it's obscured by the distribution of the themes and melodies throughout the orchestra. There's chromatic medium movement here in this piece. For example, start. When Stravinsky goes, restates the chirping theme, we move from C sharp seven to an E seven flat five chord. And again, that's what's another super interesting thing is that when we're using chromatic medians with Stravinsky, and again, Feel free to leave in the comments below if you have a different harmonic interpretation. Perhaps I'm interpreting it wrongly. I'm very open to that. A lot of my study is done in solitude. But to me, he'll take a chromatic medium movement like this, which is, that's what you would expect. And he'll go like this. So it's still a chromatic medium, but this flat five obscures that. So again, it's these, again, I'm putting quotes, simple, things that are obscured and twisted in this way, but you're never too far from home. So guys, so again, because again, remember, if we're here and then this is the chirping rhythm again, it's a little bit harder of a comeback than the first one. Well, with proper voice leading, if you just listen, Right? Stravinsky could move to one, in this case it would be A major, at any moment. Doesn't. And again, that super interesting feel that I think is very important to emphasize with Stravinsky. And again, there's some very nice, interesting harmonic elements in the harps where um, the B mixolydian scales are used as transitory elements. That's a slight, slight thing that's not as essential to the harmony as this jamming on as this chromatic median relationship between dominant chords with a lot of melodies in seconds and right next to it, right next to each other, giving the piece its feel, but it's slowing dimension. So again, guys, for the variation dance of the Firebird, we're talking about melodies close together with minor seconds, dissonances, based around deceptively simple harmony, like dominant chords moving in chromatic medians with modifications to them can create a whole sound world, right? So now I just want to briefly talk about form again. So again, to me, and it's just to me, this, these variations, I would say can, th this, this piece can fit into ABA again. Again, it's rough, right? So this is not perfect, but this chirping opening theme, the, we can call that A, right? I would. And then as we move on, these I would call some of these uh, this chromatic these chromatic licks here licks these chromatic figures in the woodwinds and the strings kind of a B kind of a just an elaboration right maybe we could even call it a development maybe we could we could actually we could even call this a mini sonatina if you if you like because this A theme is restated in different keys. And then we move on to a somewhat developmental section. As you can see, guys, I'm scrolling through the music. A lot of these, again, these, these themes of chromatic medians come up. These themes of minor seconds come up. Here we have, again, right here in the woodwinds where my mouse is, we have an earlier theme that was stated down here in the string. So he's, Stravinsky is 
moving this, let's call it B theme, between the, the orchestra. Classic, right? And then as we continue to go along, right here where my mouse is, rehearsal marker 18, we return to the chirping opening theme. And the chirping theme continues for a bit before moving into another section where we're restating some ideas from the B section and the A section. But again, here we have this triplet, you could call it retrograde version of the upward movement that we saw in the strings and woodwinds down here in the strings. Sort of a, and then again, here we are right here in, in woodwinds. We have, we have the B theme put through various transformations and a piece comes to an end. So in terms of form, again, there's an A theme, there's a B theme, there's some experimentation. Is it ABA? Is it a sonotina? Sort of like a very, 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 very small sonata form. We could, we could call it all those things. And again, is Stravinsky a sonata form composer? Well, he actually kind of was in this neoclassical era, but during this Russian era, of course not, right? At this point, sonata form was considered passe. But again, I would just recommend to everyone, no matter who you are studying, to just pick a form that seems closest to the piece you're listening to and try to, try to force it in there so you can get, again, that better handle on the form. And as far as orchestration, for this piece, again, I would just emphasize Stravinsky's genius use of strings, the rhythmic quality of the strings um, in these intervals with, again, woodwinds doing these flourishes, these sort of chromatic flourishes, gives it a very whimsical feel and it's a great choice. I would say, and again, we see this, I'll just point this out, this is a very classic orchestral trick, um, but you see he's passing this, um, um, uh, this chromatic sort of line between oboe one and then the flutes. And that's kind of a classic thing. So that if you want to have this continuous sounding line, almost harp-like arpeggiation, just pass the uh, melodic fragment or, or, or sentence or period between different players in the orchestra. Very, very, very classic, very much used by everybody. Um, but a lot of times when people are beginning composing, they'll write a super, <laughs> long line for like one flute player and it's like you know i think younger students forget that they have to breathe especially woodwind players brass players too and, and even string players it, it, it can get a little dicey if you're asking them to continue on and on and on up and up and up in tricky passages and so stravinsky tchaikovsky especially was the king of this passing one melodic line between different players super super useful that's what i'll say about that uh and uh yeah i would say brilliant use of woodwinds here um Chromaticism always sounds good in flutes if you're trying to create a little bit of, like I said, a little minor chaos, which I would call the Firebird as compared to Rite of Spring. Just an exercise in minor chaos. I think that's a great, uh, a great choice. And um, again, with Stravinsky, it's all about rhythm. So again, we just look, if you could just, if you study the score, I, I, we won't go over the whole thing in super detail here, but you can just study all the different rhythmic variations and the way they play against each other and imply different things. Um, you know, just these, these broken triplets here for the chirping. Perfect. Okay, so the next piece in the suite, uh, Ivan Syadovich and the Firebird, right? What's super interesting about this piece right off the back, we have this beautiful chromatic melody right off the back. Sorry. Right? This beautiful... With, uh, if we look at the bass, if there's any rock musicians or contemporary musicians who became or went to school for classical composition, you'll all enjoy this. We have a A5 chord in the bass and in the harps, uh, but it starts with again with that contrabass A5 chord with the oh, sorry. Right? So just very beautiful stuff. And the Firebird, I chose it because it's this, I believe it's like sort of this linkage material between the work of the Kuchka, Mussorgsky, Barad, and Rimsky, Korsakov, and the Russian music of the future. But so, for example, this piece is much more closer to the tradition of late 19th century Russian Romanticism. Very much Rimsky, Korsakov, who we know was Stravinsky's teacher, who he was indebted to quite a bit in his early years. In fact, in the Korovod later, we'll go over why that is the case. 
But so this piece, Ivan Siarovich and the Firebird, is much more quote unquote standard than the other two we've looked at so far. But I just want to point out one thing here. So we have the melody, right? Sorry. Right? And then we have this. We move up by chromatic median yet again. So again, this is yet again another example of Stravinsky and the Firebird employing chromatic medians in not so much a subtle way, but just as a standard harmonic choice for him. And again, when, when, when people are taught about chromatic medians, the first thing you think is usually Wagner. Like you think something like Siegfried, like, you know, you think something like that. But again, it's actually quite characteristic of Stravinsky. It's just done in a different way with a bit more chromaticism, I would say. And again, I would just say for the duration of this piece, we have this chromatic, this beautiful chromatic theme restated quite a bit, pass between material. Again, different themes come in, but as you can see here at rehearsal letter 32, we have somewhat of a variation on that chromatic line. More sparse orchestration here in this section. Again, a bit of a, an exploration. And again, back to pass to English horn. We see here at rehearsal letter 38, the melody returns. Well, a fragment of it returns here in the English horn. But if we look up ahead at flutes, uh, if we look at flutes one and two up here, it's now been passed to the top. Strings are doing an accompaniment figure down here. We have great, uh, we have straight um, three note clusters and the nine eight time signature down in the bass. And again, just great. And again, we have the same chromatic median when the theme is restated. If I was going to categorize this harmonically, very standard Russian late romanticism, considering where Stravinsky would go with Rite of Spring. I would call it standard Russian romanticism. Now, that being said, um, if we talk about form on this one, I would call this a bit, again, loose terms here, guys, I would call this a bit of theme and variation, because throughout this a number of Ivan Syarovich and the Firebird. We see fragments, we see modifications of this, uh, you know, uh, you know, we see different sort of rhythmic and decorations, ornaments, but we always see some element of the orchestra somewhat playing something sort of similar, not necessarily, but, and then, and then they will, and then taking a, what am I trying to say here? We will see some element of the orchestra repeat variations of that theme until, as I mentioned, we get to rehearsal number 38 and the whole thing is restated. And the theme is restated first in flutes, continues in flutes with harp strings accompanying, accompanying. And even here on page 56, we see some of the variant versions of that theme return again. And then when we reach rehearsal level 43, we get some coda material that's really just transitional material because again, ballets are continuous music into the next section of the piece. So that's the form. We have a theme and variation-esque form with standard chromatic median sort of um, Eastern sounding Russian romanticism. And the one thing I want to say though, I do want to talk about the orchestration here because it's quite nice. One thing that's very characteristic, I think, I think a lot of Rimsky-Korsakov and I think a lot of Alexander Borodin here, but as you can see, the first time we hear this melody, it's stated in the woodwinds on the English horn and the oboe. And these are kind of the go-to woodwinds for, for lack of a better word, I don't like to use this word, but for lack of a better word, exotic sounding melodies, um, very chromatic, a lot of melodies derived from octatonic scales, or derived from harmonic major or double harmonic major known as the Byzantine scale, which a lot of Russian composers, because of their proximity geographically to the Caucasus, Turkey, Azerbaijan, and whatnot, would use. And Stravinsky uses here to great effect. So, but I would just say an orchestration choice for this, and it's not, you don't have to do this, but Stravinsky and many of the Russians would often place these type of melodies, again, in the English horn, in the oboe, um, just as a standard fare. And when also, I just want to mention in terms of orchestration, the harp doesn't always have to be a gliss instrument. <laughs> I'm not sure if that's a term, but it doesn't always need to play glissando-esque figures or arpeggios. As we can see here right off the bat, 
dum, dum, sort of, it's just playing power chords. The harp can play chords quite well, and even in the low registers, deceptively well, more than you would think. A lot of times people will score these uh, type of figures, especially five chords, power chords, for the lower strings and have them sustain. But honestly, Stravinsky was right here, I think. This is the right choice, uh, orchestration-wise, to place it in the harp. And I just find that to be a thoroughly informative, again, from when studying, for me, thoroughly informative. Like, you know what, that's actually a better choice than sort of grinding away on the lower strings there. So um, I'm trying to think if there's anything else I want to say about the orchestration here. Again, we have woodwinds carrying the day. That's just sort of the nature of these types of pieces of late Russian romanticism. This use of colenio here, which is, again, a nice tone color, similar to, as we mentioned before, using the harmonics with the mute. Just a nice touch here, orchestration-wise. But yes, we want to take away from this chromatic mediance. Woodwinds are good for these types of chromatic melodies. And uh, the harp is a good uh, power chord instrument. No, I'm just kidding. Okay, so now we're going to look at the Dance of the Princess, the scherzo. And what's interesting about this piece is how very much again Stravinsky is rooted in the Russian tradition here we have a fast piece in 2-4 which to me when I see that I'm like okay we're gonna have a Russian dance type feel which is exactly what we end up happening and uh, just a fun note I love the way I just love the way the uh, <laughs> the, uh, the cello starts off Similar, and this is just a little note, but to Ride of the Valkyries, sort of. Just love that. That's just a little thing. Also, but in the serious note, trilling in that range of the cello is a very interesting sound. And it kind of has this ambiguous sound because it thins out a little bit, a little bit at that range. But that, that almost gives it a very, just very unique feel that you wouldn't necessarily get in the middle range of the viola. I can't describe it. If you're an orchestrator, you know, I think you know what I'm talking about. But anyways, the thing we want to note about this piece is uh, it's rather standard harmonically. Um, we're just going, you know, uh, so we're sort of just going, not exactly that. Those are not the inversions, but we're going, it's just basically a, a little fast Russian dance harmonically moving between one and five. That being said, of course, it's Stravinsky, so we're not just going to get standard, right? Um, and at one point when it goes doing ding, there's sort of this crazy chromatic uh, climbing thing. Thing to note, again, deceptively simple. We're just going... Uh, sorry, excuse me. Stravinsky simply climbs chromatically through a series of dominant chords. Um, if you've heard the piece, you know the section I'm talking about. But... Uh, so again, it's just another harmonic device to take from Stravinsky is simply just, you know, do something kind of just down the middle, climb in chromatic uh, dominant chords. It sounds great, to be honest with you. And again, throughout this piece, I just want to mention that um, chromatic medians abound. I'm not going to play every single example, but again, this is a very essential element of the Firebird. Chromatic medians modified oftentimes by changing chord tones uh, by a half step. Very interesting. This kind of sound, you know, you, you'll get, uh, you know, uh, you know, and then I believe that not maybe not that exact progression happens in the Dance of the Princess, but very Stravinsky. Um, interesting thing about this form-wise. This basically, this is of all the pieces we've looked at. This one fits the best straight up into a seven-part rondo. An abacaba. So if we consider this A, right? right so that, let's call that A. We're going to call this theme A, right? And then if we call the, the preceding sec or the succeeding session B, right? We can call this, right? So we're now we're, we're consider where my mouse is. Let's consider this. Let's we'll we'll take the violin. They don't, we'll call that B, right? And there's all sorts of material in B that's happening all over the place. But uh, let's call that violin theme because that's pretty consistent in, the, in violins one. And, it, and again, Stravinsky marks solo. 
which I, I haven't mentioned this thus far, but when a composer marks solo, that instrument is to be played prominently. And I'm not saying that's where the main theme is, but it is there a lot of times. And if it's, even if it's not the theme, we can impart that there's some sort of importance here. So we'll take this, right? This is the B theme. We're going on and on in B, right? Dun, 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 dun. Right, okay, so here we are. A lot of stuff happening in the woodwinds, chromaticism, a lot of rhythmic uh, parts playing against each other. Now, here we are with A again. Right? So we're back to A. Very short B. The previous section, I would call that a short B. And then we're back to A. And then this section here at rehearsal number 60, again, we have solo marked here. Right. Spiccato in the violins, but now we have this I'm going to call this C because it's a very different thing. It's related harmonically, but it's a different melody than we've had before with right? Oh, excuse me. We have this sort of mini development within C that continues for a while. This is a company material, accompaniment material here in the flutes, this group of seven, I believe we've seen somewhere before, or not. No, yes, we have, right here in the English horn. And we can call this group of seven an extension of what we saw earlier. And then, right here at rehearsal number 66, dun 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 and again, here's B. So far we have A, B, A, C. We've just restated A. Dun, 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 dun. And here we have B again. Right? And then as B transits out, we have... Right, it's, it's sort of a modified A. We'll call it A1 if you want. But basically we have a seven part rondo taking place in the span of a very short period of time, in my opinion. This is just my opinion. It's the way I've analyzed it. Um, and, but I feel like it's pretty clear that there's a, a series of different themes here. So, so far with the Dance of the Princess, we have relatively fast Russian dance type music in a seven-part rondo. Um, I would say in terms of orchestration, again, just a lot of high strings and woodwinds here creating a somewhat chaotic feel in the B section. But uh, in the A section, we have oboes and strings doubling in the A section which gives a very sort of, how do I describe this, earthy feel, I would say. And uh, Stravinsky uses that because, again, this is sort of a folk dance type number. So just, just great. Uh, let's see here, where are we? Now, we go to the Korobod. And this piece, I'm just going to mention that Stravinsky, I'm pretty sure it was shown that he took directly from Rimsky-Korsakov with, with this piece. And so, again, as compared to something like the Rite of Spring, or even Petrushka or the Nightingale, this piece sounds much closer, much, much closer to a Rimsky-Korsakov or Baroque. And we have very, and it's, oh, excuse me. It's very sort of a right in B major, very, a bit different than the rest of the Firebird, to be honest. Very sweet piece. And, um, there's not much as much to say harmonically about this uh, number because throughout it, it's very tonal, highly tonal. The, the whole piece is tonal, uh, but in a much weirder way. Here, we have this wonderful major melody uh, continue, as we can see, uh, coming in in the woodwinds, this beautiful melody continues for a bit. Strings provide very nice accompaniment, good counterpoint here. And then the theme is restated a little bit of imitation here. Stravinsky obviously studied fugue very much, and he, that came out much later in his neoclassical years, but we have some of this here. Then, so there's not much to say harmonically out here. The form, I would say, though, we can call the form of Korovad either ABA or, dare I say, some form of sonata form, right? Because what we can think of is this melody here. Right, oh, this here, with, we can call this the first theme. Then as we come here. Th 
we can kind of call this the second theme group. And as this develops, we kind of end up in a bit of a development section. Something to take from Stravinsky. The Korobod's a bit more standard, and he could really speak in the late Russian romantic language if he wanted. Okay, and now we come to the most epic, perhaps my favorite part of the Firebird Suite, the Infernal Dance, which it's so funny, like growing up, it sounds, I, I used to think when I was a kid, it sounded like John Williams, but the truth is we know that, you know, John Williams just borrowed this sound of the doom, 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 doom. So harmonically, what we want to say about the Infernal Dance, again, is deceptively simple. We're basically, uh, right? Very A minor, just A minor, with of course, you know, some added. This tritone, of course, gives it that extra interesting, excuse me, excuse me. Gives it that interesting feel. Now, also to note, these orchestral hits have been sampled so many times, so many times in the early 90s in a lot of New Jack Swing. Uh, at this point, I believe Firebird was in public domain, but Stravinsky, has been sampled so many times, just for these hits have. But when we get to this string figure here, again, it's like what we talked about in the variations on the Firebird. It sort of sounds very chromatic, but actually, it can actually be thought of as a, an E-flat major type situation. Now, what does that imply for the harmonic nature of the Infernal Dance? I would say that not exactly the same kind of relationship we saw at the beginning in the introduction where it was two major chords of tritone apart. Here we have moving from A minor to... This tritone relation exists. And I would just say that with Stravinsky and the Russians in general, they exploited the drama of that quite effectively as we see in the Infernal Dance. And there's one other... Uh, moment I want to point out to everyone. Um, yes, here we are. Rehearsal letter 150. Right? We have this wonderful... I'll play it up here. Right? So what's interesting is that this is in fact over an E flat minor nine chord. So it would be something of the equivalent of. And again, this chord, this E flat minor nine, you can voice it like that if you like, is spread throughout the orchestra in such an amazing way. And I guess that's another, again, we're studying the harmony of Stravinsky, right? I would just say that chords with tensions spread across the orchestra with wonderful sort of simple melodic cells. Right, over this sort of... Uh, creates this wonderful tension, and I just wanted to point that out because it's one of my favorite moments and one of the most epic moments of the piece. So again, tritone relations, tensions, these are all harmonic things we want to focus on when looking at this. I would call the form of the Infernal Dance, and let me just get back to it with my bookmark here, guys. I would call this form, because we have this dun do do dun 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 do 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 I would call that, this is a bit of a sonata form. That I would call our main theme. It develops. Some transitory transition material. And then when we come to this theme that I just demonstrated, one of my favorite things ever. Instead of, you know, relationship of one and five, let's call it, or in minor, sonata form would be one and flat three major. Let's call it uh, one and uh, flat five major right? That happens 
Then we move on to what ostensibly is a development section with a lot of uh, new theme thematic information uh, added. Lots of old little fragments of themes coming back. And uh, right here we have, here in the horns, this was stated in the beginning. It was sort of the end of the general sentence of the do 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 this here is restated that a theme is then restated in the strings and then we have a bit of a coda at the end and then we have the melody and the final hymn to close us out and uh, those are much more tonal numbers uh, so I'm not going to get into them as much only to say that Stravinsky is entirely fluent in the romantic late Russian uh, language now, I hope you all enjoyed this and learned something the way I was able to learn something by really um, going over the score and analyzing it in depth. Um, if you liked what you saw, please uh, subscribe, leave a comment, tell me what you thought. And uh, I am excited to do some a piece from the neoclassical era of Stravinsky. I'm not sure which one yet, but I have a couple of suggestions. So anyways, thank you guys so much for watching. Thank